I'm sure that many after watching this video will tell me stick to planes and they will don't worry this video is a one-off that i resisted doing for almost a couple of years but recently i have seen so many misinterpretations in the comments and i received so many requests on this subject that i finally decided to cover it what am i talking about i'm talking about the idea that money is the measure of the military capabilities that can be deployed by a country and mind I will be covering the obvious because nobody ever covers it. So it is commonly accepted that money is actually required to do pretty much everything, but it should be under everyone's eyes that this is not the case. Your money, if you live in a moderately developed country, is just a bunch of bits in a computer. It is completely immaterial. It is pure information and how this pure information should help in building even a primitive sling? Well, it's anyone's guess. While even gold doesn't qualify as useful, it is a metal with pretty poor characteristics and the only military notable feature is the resistance to corrosion. You can't build weapons with gold, albeit being hit by a gold bar is probably painful. Yes, of course, I know the government taxes the citizens and uses that money to buy military equipment from the industry and many would say that the governments do this pretty inefficiently. And when the government spending is above the tax income, it issues debt, actually placing a burden on the future generations. Yeah, true, everybody knows that. Well, if it is true, where is the citizens' money coming from? From their hard work, you may say. But in this case, since their income depends from companies that are paid by other citizens, whose income depends from companies that are paid by the other citizens and so on, where did they get the money from? You can't just make your money, can't you? <laughs> well, this is even more immaterial than normal money and the reason why such an abstract concept is actually worth so much money, well, it's complicated and definitely outside the scope of this video, so let's move on for now. So, what is the source of money? The mint? Well, yes, for metallic coins and banknotes, but this in most countries is actually just a small fraction of all the circulating money. And anyway, how those coins or banknotes are actually put in the hands of the public? Is it by the cash machine? Well, actually people withdraw from the cash machine money that they have already put in the bank. So it can't be new money, right? Do you see that the conventional narration has some shaky foundations? Nobody talks about this, but not because there is any mystery or because there is a conspiracy. This is actually information that is plainly available in plenty of uh, university level books or countless articles or scientific papers online. The problem is that the media hardly ever cover the basics. If you just follow the media, you are probably missing a few points. The kind of picture that you get from the media is that of money as being a sort of a token with a value that can be used to acquire goods and services, or it can be converted in different currencies, or worse, you get the picture that money is something that has an intrinsic value and it is sort of at the center of human interactions. So, a modern state has three ways of financing its expenses. It can tax the citizens, it can issue debt, or it can create money out of thin air. So the state creates money out of thin air, or it could be the central bank in coordination with the state, usually not against the state. With the same money, the state 
makes purchases of goods, for example, military gear or services. That money pays the salaries of workers and servicemen who in turn use that money to acquire goods and services from other private companies, who in turn use that money to pay their employees, who in turn use that money to acquire goods and services from other companies, their expenses pay the salary of other employees and... Okay, you get the point. If money is not created by the state or the central bank first and then put in someone's pockets to be spent, there is no money circulating. For completeness, let me mention that a large fraction of the money circulating in the economy is actually created by the banks through loans, but this is out of scope, I won't get into the details here. Well, not all the countries can create money like this. For example, countries that are part of a monetary union, like the countries that are part of the euro area, they can't do this. But I'm digressing. Taxes have two functions. The first is to impose the legal tender in a country. Money that can be used to pay the taxes is of a lower utility because to pay the taxes will need to be sort of converted into legal tender and this could be a problem because it exposes you to the risk of the variations of the exchange rate and also to sometimes non-negligible transaction costs. Moreover, taxes are one of the levers that a state has to regulate the state of the economy and the inflation. High taxes slow down the economy and lower the inflation, low taxes do the opposite. And always for completeness, let me notice that the inflation may be exogenous, that is connected to external shocks not related to the state of the economy. But again, this is out of scope. It is just a different form of money creation. The interest paid on that is either money created out of thin air or the debt is just simply rolled over. The financial markets actually require assets that have zero risk and that can be used as a totally reliable collateral for all kinds of operations. Obviously, you can't create money and debt indefinitely with no consequences. There is a point where other parts of the economy react and issues like inflation or the valuation actually start to happen. They defaulted in dollars, not in pesos. If the debt is in a currency that you are controlling, you can always create enough money to repay the debt, no matter what. Despite what is usually believed, a large stock of debt is actually functional to the wealth of a country if it is denominated in the country's currency. The poorest countries in the world have a very low level of public debt, while the relatively developed countries tend to have a relatively high level of public debt. The difference is that the poorest countries have a very high level of foreign debt, while developed countries tend to have lower levels. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you how the core of monetary economics is actually working. No serious economist will tell you that I am factually wrong. What is wildly different though is the value judgment on these policies. Some people believe that money creation is always bad, some others believe that it is always good. Some people think that public debt is always bad, some others think that it is always good. Some think that devaluing a currency is like cheating, some others think that it is a perfectly legitimate tool available to the government to manage the economy. Some believe in big governments, some others believe in small governments. Some have ethical reasons to give these judgments, and some others just speak according to their interest. Point is, there is no economic policy that favors everyone in the same way. There will always be differences. Hence, there are different schools of thought that favor specific stakeholders. 
It is as simple as that. Actually, everybody says so. It is in the books. The difference with what I'm saying and what you can read in a book is that often, way too often, the simple concepts are mixed with the judgment that I was mentioning before. So together with the functioning of the monetary economy, you are also thought what is good and what is bad according to the authors of the book. Why did I open this can of worms? Because you need to understand these few points to understand why money, particularly during a conflict, is not a limiting factor. Money in a conflict doesn't matter at all if, if one very important factor is true. So if the state can create money at will, then there should be no problem in acquiring everything, including military gear. Well, money, as I said before, cannot be created with no limits at all. There are boundaries beyond which some other effects happen, like inflation and devaluation. And the economic science has a pretty good idea where these boundaries are. And by the way, too little money has problems as too much money too. However, just before or during a conflict, when survival is at stake, inflation and other economic metrics are definitely a minor concern. Inflation is way less important than losing a battle or losing a piece of your national territory or uh, having heavy losses or anything like that. In those situations, since the creation of money is basically an act of will, then as much money as it is needed can be created. When survival is at stake, then lack of money cannot be the limiting factor. You may think, if I can create an infinite amount of money, then I can acquire an infinite amount of gear. Well, no, obviously there is a limit. In fact, there is a very real limit. It is your production capacity, your manufacturing capacity, your technology capacity. In fact, if a country has the entire supply chain under its own control, from the raw material to the finished product, there is no reason why there won't be enough money to go through the entire supply chain and have the production working at full capacity. Now, it is clear that there will be economical effect from this creation of money and from the fact that you're actually investing in the production of stuff that is going to be destroyed somewhere on the battlefield. However, these effects will be secondary and way less relevant than losing a battle, losing human lives or losing a piece of your territory. There will always be time to deal with these issues afterwards, either after the victory or the defeat in different ways, obviously. Also, they may not be necessarily negative macroeconomic effects. Uh, the question is actually debated, but some economists believe that the United States really came out of the Great Depression of 1929 only because of uh, the great uh, stimulus of the World War, uh, War economy. Mind, this is true only if, only if the entire supply chain, or actually better, the myriad of supply chains that are actually required to produce all the enormous quantities of materials that are required during a war are under national control. Because in this way, your national currency can pay for all the expenses. All the companies involved will use their national currency to trade with other companies within their national borders. The United States during the Second World War were a very good approximation of this situation. Nazi Germany, on the contrary, it wasn't because they had a critical element missing, that is oil. And the lack of oil actually brought to some strategic choices that, when enacted, ended up putting Germany in a difficult position and ultimately 
led to the German defeat. The United States are a particular case in this respect because of the Bretton Woods agreements at the end of World War II. More on this later, but for now it is enough to know that the nature of this agreement made the dollar, the US dollar, in demand both internally and abroad. Russia is largely self-sufficient when it comes to military equipment, with a few exceptions, particularly in terms of chips for electronic circuits. And also China is in a similar situation, even though the missing elements are probably more important because we are talking aircraft engines, basically. However, both countries are working hard to fill the gap, and I'm sure that now you can understand why. So. All the discussions about the country X not having enough money for the program Y are just peacetime discussions. There is no chance for a country to go bankrupt and not having enough money to pay for all the military assets that are required because money can be created at will. At the same time, GDP comparisons between countries can be very misleading because they tend to compare the GDPs with reference to a common baseline, but they don't really tell you what can be bought with a specific amount of money within a country. Okay, so far we have assumed that the entire supply chain is under national control. But what happens when it is not? What happens if some relevant parts of the supply chains that are required to keep fighting the war require for components, goods, whatever, to be acquired abroad? Well, in this case, everything changes. The key point is that the foreign seller will ask to be paid in its own currencies. Or better, the actual transaction may be conducted in either currencies, but at some point the seller will have to pay its own employees or pay its own suppliers, and he will need its own national currency, not your own that you are acquiring. At some point, a conversion has to take place. But, actually, conversion is a misleading term. Money is not a unit of measure that can be converted as needed. Money is something that you buy or sell. So, for example, if you need to acquire something from Russia, at some point you will need to pay in rubles, and before paying you will have to acquire rubles somehow. And this is obtained in two ways, either borrowing rubles or selling something else to Russia. In the first case, you will have to repay the debt in, obviously, currency that is different from your own. Borrowing in foreign currency, particularly in times of war, is something that can put you in troubles very quickly. If you are borrowing, you will have to repay the debt. And the only way to repay the debt is either making more debt to pay the debt, and it's easy to understand that in this case it's going to spiral out of control quite quickly. The other solution is that you have to sell Russia something that they want and they are happy to pay in rubles. But this means that you will have to transform or orient part of your economy toward these foreign sales, hoping that the Russians will actually buy from you whatever you're selling. This is the concept, but actually, as a consequence of the Bretton Woods Agreement, a large percentage of the international transactions are settled in dollars. The US dollar in international trade is used as a sort of a reference currency. So two countries, rather than exchanging their own national currencies, they exchange dollars. Now, since everybody needs to acquire dollars, this makes the dollar the most in-demand currency on the planet, exactly because it's used for the international transactions. If you forgive the improper analogy, the dollar acts as the lubricant of the world economy. This is not the natural consequence of anything being special with the dollar, or is not a consequence of the great economic strength of the United States. Nothing like that. It is simply the result of a decision taken about 70 years ago, at a time and in a situation where the United States could apply enough pressure on the international partners to have an agreement like this. Before the dollar, the British pound has a similar role. 
and the, before the pound it was the Spanish real and before the real it was the Dutch gilden and before the gilden it was the Florentine Fiorino. Obviously there are no guns pointed at the head of a country that prevent conducting international transactions in different currencies. In fact, for example, Russia and China are trying to reduce the use of dollar for their uh, reciprocal exchanges. So, coming back to our point, to acquire something abroad, you will need to procure either dollars or another foreign currency, and you may well be in the position that at some point you will run out of it. Or, a country in need may end up accumulating so much debt that at the end it will default on the foreign currency debt and the financing will stop anyway. So, in this case, money matters, matters a lot. No, money is not the problem. The lack of capacity of producing everything that is necessary to sustain the military effort is the problem. Money is a tool, money is a facilitator, money has no intrinsic value whatsoever. So it is blatantly obvious that a country that controls the entire supply chain is always going to be in a much better position than a country that doesn't. Obviously some countries are just too small or too underdeveloped to point to self-sufficiency. This may be an intrinsic weakness very hard to overcome. I seriously doubt that Andorra is ever going to be a military power. However, there are several countries in the world that can aim to a long-term self-sufficiency. Some are doing, for example, like India, some others are not. And this is not an economical, not a technical, but a political choice. And we can't really speak of good strategy or bad strategy. Every country is different. Every country has its own purpose. Every country has its own culture. Every country has its own politics. In any case, the availability of financial resources or the size of the GDP are not a good measure of the military potential. A large economy based mostly on trade can incur in that currency scarcity that we have described before. Even a relatively large economy but based on services like in many Western countries could be less efficient than a smaller economy but based on manufacturing and production in sustaining the country's effort during a conflict. So everything boils down to the resources available to a country and its industrial base. As simple as that. And probably, this is actually intuitive, probably you have known this since the beginning. Okay, if you have followed me till now, well, thank you and congratulations. I realized that it wasn't easy. I am fully conscious that for some, the economy is a sort of a religion and some economical concepts are some sort of moral truth. So I fully expect that the comment section is going to become a fighting arena. There is nothing I can do about other than not doing any more videos like this. So don't worry, I will get back to planes very soon. But I hope that those who were interested in understanding why I often say that money is not really a problem now have their answer. I hope this was interesting, at least for some of you. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.